Okay, thank you very much, Alastair. Uh, as he mentioned, I'm from the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies here in Hobart. I'm a Hobart local, and I have to say you've totally impressed me tonight, Hobart, with this sort of uh, turnout. It's fantastic to see this many people here that's interested in finding out a little bit more, and hopefully we can answer some of your questions later. Now, marine climate change is particularly important because our planet is 70% water. Often it's out of mind, out of sight, uh, but as Camille's just shown, there are significant changes happening in our oceans. So our ocean absorbs around 80% of the additional heat that we put in the atmosphere and around 50% of the carbon that we put in the atmosphere. So significant changes happening in our ocean, acidification being one of those, and it's not something I'm going to cover tonight. We've got eight minutes. It's not enough time to cover everything. So lots of changes other than what uh, I'm going to talk about. I want to tell you three things uh, tonight. One is that small changes in temperature lead to large differences uh, and changes in biology and ecology, and we've, we've heard from Camille about some of that. The second thing, I'd like to show you some changes that are specific to Tasmanian marine ecosystems, so our, back, our marine backyard, if you like. And the last thing there, I want to show you how you can help, uh, how you can help us understand some of these patterns. So the first thing there around small changes in the physical environment leading to large biological impacts. And I want to use this graph here as, as an example to illustrate a general principle in biology. Most species have a pretty defined temperature range that they, that they thrive in. And this graph here shows heart rate in an American lobster, uh, heart rate along, along the axis there and temperature along the bottom here. And what you can see is that when it's really cold or really hot, that heart rate is very, very slow. But there's a pretty defined temperature range in the middle there and, and 24 degrees is when they're at maximal uh, capacity, maximal performance. We push that temperature change just one degree, one degree, and their heart rate is down to half the maximum capacity. This is called a thermal response curve, and it shows how just one degree can have a major impact on, on an animal or on a biological process. I could put almost anything to do with animals along this uh, axis there. Instead of heart rate, that could be growth rate, it could be larval survival, it could be metabolism, it could be the maximum speed an animal can go at when they're trying to escape a predator. Almost every process in biology has, has a defined temperature range and one degree can actually make a very big difference. Just to give you a local example uh, from here in, in Tasmania, uh, we've had a poleward expansion of the long spine sea urchin. Our, our uh, kelp ecosystems off the east coast of Tasmania should be looking like this. Nice, lush, healthy kelp uh, ecosystems, but a lot of them look like this, rocky urchin barrens. So kelp move in, uh, sorry, kelp uh, urchins move into those kelp uh, habitats uh, and denude the area of, of all that algal and plant material and leave these rocky urchin barrens. Temperature is not the only reason that urchin has moved down the coastline. It's a pretty complicated process, but often it can be the, the tipping point, if you like. What happens with this sea urchin is that their larvae need a 12, 12 degrees to develop properly. Uh, 11 degrees, not so many of the larvae survive. One degree more, 12 degrees, and a large number of those larvae can survive and thrive, and we end up with a whole lot more urchins off our east coast, creating this kind of system where rock lobster and abalone reef fish uh, don't find particularly appealing, neither do scuba divers, fishes, uh, those kinds of things. So one degree uh, off our east coast, and, and it can have a, has had a very large impact. The other thing about warming waters, generally, uh, as our waters warm, animals use more energy to breathe, they have less energy available to reproduce. In addition to that, warmer water actually holds less oxygen. So their demands and their need for oxygen go up, but the oxygen in the water goes down. That means higher temperatures place uh, greater stress on animals and more stress makes animals susceptible to disease. So just some general things there about temperature. So what change have we had off our east, off, off our east coast here in Tasmania? We've had a bit of a double whammy. So we get the underlying warming that most of the rest of the ocean gets, 
But we've also had a significant change in current system. So the East Australian Current, that current that uh, brought Nemo's dad cruising down the East Coast in the movie, that's a seasonal current. It comes down to Tasmania in summer and it pushes away again in winter. We're actually seeing that current sitting off our East Australian coast for a much larger proportion of the year. So that current has actually moved around 350 kilometres further south in the last 60 years. So a very significant change for us off the East Coast. This looks a bit horrific, but basically it's, it's a food web diagram. We've got things at the base of the food chain on the bottom here, so bacteria, uh, detritus. Up the top we've got whales and then you know, seals and, and fish and things in the middle. What I want to show you here is if I put a black circle around the components of that ecosystem, and this is our ecosystem off the east coast, I'll put a black circle around every part of that where we've documented changes consistent with climate change. And you can see that that is fairly extensive throughout all levels of our ecosystem. So some significant changes that have occurred there. So to be a bit specific, I've told you about the polewood expansion of sea urchins. There's also a whole lot of intertidal species uh, that have moved polewoods as well. We've had changing composition of phytoplankton blooms, increased tropical species, uh, red tides. We've had around 85% of seaweeds that have moved further south as well. And over 70 coastal fish species that have been documented to be shifting where they live. So some fairly significant changes underwater that we just don't really see about. As Camille mentioned, we have a whole lot of variation. There's some, some general principles there. Uh, we know the basics, but the devil's in the detail. And, we, and it's quite hard to find out that detail. In Australia, we have 60,000 kilometres of coastline. It's a, you know, not, not, a, not a very high population. Um, uh, some might say a diminishing scientific community to, to measure changes that we have in our systems. And we thought, how can we monitor species range shifts around the ocean? Beyond a shadow of a doubt, the gold standard are the highly structured scientific surveys uh, that, that programs like Reef Life Survey, uh, another project run out of uh, the Institute for Marine and Antarctic Studies, that's our gold standard. Uh, but there are other ways that we can find out some information about how our systems are changing. And we thought we have around 4 million Australians that are out on the water, uh, fishing, diving, boating, beach combing. We thought, what if we can get just a small percentage of their observations and record them and, and use them in a robust way? It's essentially taking observations and pictures from the community and turning those into data that we use. So we started the Range Extension Database and Mapping Project, or REDMAP. Um, I'm not sure if there's anyone here that's submitted data to REDMAP in the audience. Is there anyone? Oh, yeah, there's a couple of hands. Cool. OK. Um, so REDMAP's about citizens uh, sending in photographs of species that are unusual in a given location. So fishers and divers see something that they don't usually see in Tasmania or in New South Wales, and they send that photo in. We send that around to a network of around 80 scientists around the country. What they, they verify that observation, and we put it up on the website. And you can see that we've had uh, sightings from uh, all around the coastline. Some of those are just animals that we don't have a lot of data on, so we can't say whether they're shifting or not. Uh, other ones of those are observations that are out of range, but again, we need data over a number of years, uh, you know, a long period of time to start saying whether these animals are conclusively shifting where they live or not. But they are proving to be a very good early indication of what species might be shifting and changing where they live. This are, these are the kind of photos that we get sent into the project and you can see that they're quite nice, clear photos, good for getting IDs. Uh, as I mentioned, every photo that's sent in is verified. And to give you an idea of the kind of information that we get from the project, so these are the, some sightings for yellowtail kingfish. This is a species that we've had recorded uh, off our north coast sort of fairly intermittently for a number of years, but now we're starting to see large schools of, of individuals 
in, in the southeast of Tasmania fairly consistently and over winter. So a reasonable indication, uh, and we've seen these over a number of years as well, so a reasonable indication that this is a species, for example, that is starting to become a part of our ecosystem. Not going into the detail here, but we've been able to use the observations from RedMap in a number of studies, and there's, there's um, a, a, another range of papers to add to that. But what I wanted to show you is that we've got 60,000 kilometres of coastline, we have three or four million fishes, we have around two million dives that take place uh, around the coast, and it's information from those people, people like you out in the audience, that we can really use uh, to try and get an early indication of the changes that we're seeing around the country. Even if you are not out in the water, you can still help the project by uh, you know, sharing our, our news items on Facebook or following us on Twitter and, and uh, basically uh, helping us get the message out there that a place exists where fishers and divers and beachcombers can send in observations that we are using uh, to help understand how our marine ecosystems are changing. We have uh, lots of... Uh, local supporters here in Tasmania that help the project and a lot of funders uh, around Australia as well. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to finish and thank you very much and I look forward to your questions.